So today, uh, I want to talk about a subject uh, sort of like the old uh, Free Soil Party, very, uh, which I have a sentimental attachment to, which is the rise of the Republican Party in the 1850s. Um, my sentimental attachment doesn't have to do with the current Republican Party as much as the original one, because that was the subject, as I've said before, of my first book, Free Soil, Free Labor, Free Men, published a long, long time ago, but still there's a little life in that old dog yet. Um, it's used around some places. Ashworth quotes it from time to time in his book on our reading list, although I have to admit that I told him I wouldn't assign his book in my class unless he cited me in a footnote. <laughs> but. Um, Anyway, it's about the rise of the Republican Party. So this has been a sort of on my mind for a long, long time in my uh, career. But one thing that book, which is not on the reading list, so people don't have to worry about it, uh, that I didn't do in that book, it was a study of ideology, of ideas, political ideas, political organization, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But one thing I didn't do, which is very important, is to ground that in the, you might say, the economic changes, the very substantial economic changes that were going on in the North in the decade or so before the Civil War. This is not, quote unquote, the cause of the Civil War, but it has something to do with it, and we need to understand uh, how, that, uh, how that operated. From, the, from about 1840, the United States suffered in the 19th century periodic economic crises or depressions or panics, as they called them, more or less every 20 years, the Panic of 1819, Panic of 1837, Panic of 1857, a long depression starting in 1873, another one in 1893. It seems like every 20 years there was a significant economic downturn. But bet the, between about 1843 or 44, when the Panic of 1837 kind of came to an end, and 1857, you had 15 years of very substantial economic growth and, um, and economic transformation, particularly in the North. Um, and out of, this, out of this growth will come or will affect the development of this new political uh, alignment which will take over in the country in the 1850s. One of the key catalysts for this economic growth was the completion of the transportation network. Um, the, or the market revolution, you might say, which had begun uh, earlier on. Uh, the key, th the railroad, the, the, is now the key element in this in this later phase of the market revolution. Earlier, it had been steamboats, canals. Now, this is the period the railroad really comes to dominate transportation, particularly in the North and what we call the Old Northwest, Illinois, Michigan, Ohio, Wisconsin, that that area. Um, the United States, the railroad building, uh, the railroads displace canals as the main sort of uh, vehicle for transportation of goods other than rivers within the country, which still remain very important. Um, the mileage of track, mi by 1852, the, there were 10,000 miles of railroad track in the United States, and by 1860, 30,000. In other words, it tripled the railroad track mileage tripled in the 1830s. By 1860, the United States had more miles of railroad track than all the rest of the world put together. We were not the first to develop railroads. Britain was, but we were the first to really, you know, create a, a giant national railroad network. Um, and this is just an ad for the Illinois Central, one of the great railroads of this period, which uh, went north-south in Illinois, from Chicago down to the very bottom of Illinois, uh, Cairo, they call it, and some other branches. I don't know if anyone here is from Illinois. If so, you can look at the names of all those little towns on there. It's probably quicker back then to get from Panola to Minonk than it is today with traffic jams and all that, especially if Governor Christie is out there. But, uh, but this was, and you see the picture, you know, this is sort of primitive-looking railroads, that came, the, fir the first car is a freight car, the second car is a passenger car, but this makes, you know, the railroad obviously has enormous advantages over canals and rivers. One thing we can understand 
going outdoors here is they don't freeze. Canals freeze in the winter, especially upstate like the Erie Canal. Rivers freeze or get clogged with ice sometimes, not railroads. They, they, um, they roll along all, all year long, by and large. The railroad is today mostly extinct, except in a few parts of the country. But it, as I said, in pre-Civil War America, it really created this, national, this truly national market. It enriched cities like Chicago. Chicago did not even exist in 1840, more or less. Just a tiny settlement. By 1860, it's a giant metropolis. Baltimore becomes a major hub of railroad communication. Of course, New York does also, with, and Philadelphia, with these great, what we call the trunk railroads, the New York Central, the Pennsylvania Railroad, heading out to the west. Um, the railroad also penetrates, of course, areas which are not near rivers or canals. It opens up vast areas in the interior of the country to commercial agriculture, to agriculture where farmers can market their crops very readily because of the uh, proximity of railroads. It galvanizes a massive shift away from subsistence farming that is farming for your own consumption, to commercial farming for the marketplace. It also, the building of railroads gives a giant boost to the iron industry. It absorbs an enormous amount of iron manufacturing and, of course, the steel industry a little bit later on. Coal mining, it has all sorts of, because um, coal will become the main fuel here, uh, all sorts of um, ramifications through the economy. Um, and by the way, also real estate speculation. Wherever, whenever a railroad is projected, the value of land along the pro prominent route goes up and people buy up land and it, it promotes settlement, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the primary thing, as I say, in the old Northwest is it makes, um, it makes farming easily accessible to, um, to, uh, to, to markets. The 1850s, wheat and corn production skyrocket. It don't, they don't become quite as important as cotton because cotton is an export crop. Most of the cotton crop is sent abroad. Most of the wheat and corn at this time is consumed within the United States, um, although some of the wheat is uh, exported to Great Britain. Most of it is, 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 um, is consumed in the United States, especially as eastern cities are growing rapidly because of immigration. We talked about immigration last time, the population rising very quickly, particularly in the northern states because of immigration. So these urban centers, a kind of reciprocal interconnection develops between these urban centers in the east and commercial farming in the west. The farmers are purchasing goods produced in the east, and, they're, they, and the eastern cities are purchasing farm products produced um, further west. As to eastern farmers, of whom there are many, uh, they become increasingly focused on local, what we call truck farming, you know, like dairy or vegetables or things that are perishable and can be sold into nearby markets. But uh, if you're a, uh, a commercial farmer in the east, uh, you will find that the competition from uh, the west becomes uh, harder and harder, and many people, of course, move west. The population of these, and remember, I'm talking about Illinois, I'm talking about, um, you know, Michigan and Wisconsin. We're not talking about California yet or what we today would uh, consider the west. Um, but contrast this to the situation in the south. The south is growing, no question about it, and the economy is burgeoning with cotton, but it's a different kind of economic growth. Both sections are growing economically, but on different paths, you might say. In the North, you're getting a fully integrated economy of, as we'll see in a minute, small industry, commercial agriculture, a kind of symbiotic relationship between the two of them with a, hot, with a very strong internal market absorbing these products, whereas in the South, the internal market is very restricted. Slaves, do not buy anything, right? There's a giant luxury market for big planters, but there's a vast, uh, the largest population in the South are what we call yeoman farmers, small farmers, many of them really isolated from market relations. Uh, they, don't, they don't really purchase a lot um, as much uh, as, as northern ones do, and they mostly are producing for their own consumption. They're not really 
Uh, they're not producing cotton by in, in, in any large numbers. They're producing food. So the, the, the internal market in the South is much less developed than, um, than in the North. Chicago, as I said, that's why I put the Illinois Central here, is sort of the symbol of this new era. Chicago, because of the railroad, becomes the center of a giant hinterland of agriculture, one of the great agricultural producing regions of the world in this era. Stretching out, if you're from Chicago or that region, you know what I'm talking about. Iowa, southern Wisconsin, the top half of Illinois, this vast area of wheat and corn production all shipped through Chicago by, uh, by, the, um, by the railroad. And also, uh, more and more mechanized. Chicago is the home of the McCormick Reaper uh, factories in the 1850s, where agricultural machinery is becoming more and more important. It's, as I say, these are not giant agribusiness like we have today, but they're still uh, farmers using more modern technology on their, on their farms. Um, now, let me, um, let me show you this railroad map. Can be, yeah, there, okay. There's a railroad map from the 1850s. The red lines, the, the red east-west lines are the major trunk railroads. Uh, the Baltimore and Ohio, the Pennsylvania, the New York Central, others. Um, and then there's a lot of other. They're a little harder to see, the other railroads in there going all over the place. You see the concentration of railroad lines in Ohio, in Illinois, uh, in southern Wisconsin, gathering up agricultural produce. Um, then look at the South. The South has railroad development, too. In fact, the very first railroad in the United States was built in South Carolina in the very late 1820s. South's got plenty of railroads, but there's no, it, they don't have a railroad system. They don't have a railroad network, is what I mean. Um, Many of the roads are very short. They, the purpo you can't get, for example, from Richmond to New Orleans by train, um, as you could get from New York to Chicago very easily by train. Um, a lot of those lines are short. Their main purpose is to carry cotton to places where it can be exported, either to the coast, like down to Charleston, or to canals or rivers. You see the, canal, the, the one going across Mississippi east-west to Vicksburg and the Mississippi River. The railroad, like everything else in the South, is subordinate to the cotton plantation, right? It, is a, it, is a, it serves the cotton plantation. It is not a vehicle for economic development, economic transformation. It simply reinforces the economic system that already um, that already exists. 